Planet X, the most terrible day. I'm reading from Zetatalk.com on the first page at Zetatalk.com. Click on Pole Shift and you'll find this article and many others if you're interested in the Pole Shift. This was written July 15, 1996, and it's pretty interesting. So let's get into it. The day of a significant pole shift, such as will occur on this next passage of the twelfth planet, is one that no human on earth will be able to ignore. For most, it will be a most terrible day. The first paragraph reads, Those who have had no forewarning will be no worse off than those who have heard rumors but have been unable to make changes in their lives to prepare. In fact, having no forewarning will almost be a blessing for those unable to prepare, as in this way they will not agonize over the choices that they made. Those who have prepared will be in a state of high anxiety, imagining the worst, regardless of whether a human realizes what is about to happen, but has been unable to take themselves to safety, or has no realization the effect is the same. They wait for what is to come next. As we have described, this waiting can take the form of distractions such as parties or denial, such as continuing with the daily routine as though everything were normal, but for most this will be a type of breath holding. They're in shock from the time they realize that the earth has stopped rotating until the pole shift. They are essentially in shock for days. That will certainly be a time of panic. And I think it will be a time of chaos. It will be a time of criminal activity. Everybody that you thought was your closest friend will turn out to be your worst enemy because they know what you have. If you have stored food, they want it. And they might put a gun in your face to get it. Because if they don't, they're going to die. If you have a place of safety... They want it, and they'll kill you to get it. So nobody is safe. Even those who prepare are not safe. Next paragraph. For those along coastlines, the hour when the Earth's crust moves along with the core to its new position is not the time of trauma until the Earth's core and crust stop. Now imagine that. It's like riding in a truck with a jacuzzi in the back full of water. And when that crust moves, it's like the truck taking off real fast. All the water goes sloshing. And when it stops, the water sloshes again. I would not want to be near the coast. Continuing, it is then that the massive tidal waves roll slowly up into the coastal areas, first on one side of a body of water, then later when the water sloshes back on the other side. Both tides are equally as devastating, starting and stopping. It's like trying to ride in the back with the jacuzzi and not get wet. Only this water doesn't just wet you. It knocks down buildings and drags everything across the land on the way in and across the land on the way out, dragging all the people, buildings, cars, and everything out to sea. Being on high ground along the coastline is no safety factor if the water has nowhere to go, as the press of water behind the wave head will force the water up when meeting a barrier, so one is flooded anyway. You might recall that they found whale bones at the tops of mountains, so this water will go to the highest peaks temporarily. And the whales that they found at the tops of those mountains had bones broken and they were all ages, which means they died in a catastrophe. So all you people out there who said, I've got a garden and I can survive, your garden will not save you. Continuing, riding the waves results in being dashed against barriers and allowing the wave to engulf one is a certain drowning fortunately a painless death. Thus those along the coastlines die from tidal waves almost invariably if they are not dead already. This is like a surfer who rides a wave without a board and is slammed against the rocks in Hawaii. I was on the beach in Oahu and you can really get cut up on the lava beaches. The volcanic 
flows form these islands, and you know it. You get really cut up when you surf in shallow water in Hawaii, some places. Where I was, I was on Oahu, and those beaches were nasty. It was a long time ago, 1978. I went two years in a row, 77 and 78, I think. I don't remember too much. I can't tell you the specific beach, but I remember you can really get... I was surfing, and I really got cut up. So if you're on the top of the water, you can be slammed against a, a, a building, and the building may be made of glass. It's going to be a quick death, I believe, but it could be an awful death. Next paragraph. For those inland, beyond the reach of tidal waves, the earthquakes are devastating. All but the flimsiest of housing is wrenched so violently that it collapses, crushing and trapping those inside. Those inside tents or straw huts will find themselves, along with their housing, jerked sideways, but aside from scrapes and bruises, relatively unharmed. Oh, great. So everybody in an apartment building is going to have the whole building coming down on them, regardless of building codes. None of the building codes anticipated this kind of event. Lying on the ground during this time is in and of itself a protection, as friction along the ground prevents one from being hurled. In the cities, structures collapse, creating the scenario seen after major earthquakes in the extreme everywhere. Some people are going to suffer a terrible death. In California, there were people trapped in a building that fell for a week. Awful. And some of them survived. Very few. If a building comes down on you, you're better off if you're crushed and killed in a second rather than to live for a week with a structure above you and no way to move, trapped in a small area, unable to get out. And nobody will be able to save you. Whereas in California, they had all the rescue workers there lifting off the stuff. And they pulled the guy out finally. had had dogs looking for the live people and the dead bodies. The injured die from lack of treatment. And the living soon sicken from drinking sewage contaminated water. And with transportation blocked on all sides, starvation soon takes its toll also. Have a nice day. Sorry, folks. I think it's better for you to experience it here with this video and have some idea what's coming than to close the door on this information and wind up in a situation where a building is coming down on you. The pole shift will be preceded by days of darkness on one side of the earth and days of light. You can do something in those times because at that point, you will know we're in for a pole shift. I would grab a shovel and drive to the country, dig a hole, and if there's a powerful wind, I'd get in the hole. Make sure you have water because you're not going to last long without water. Food, you might last a month, maybe, but the water will be worth its weight in gold. Next paragraph. Those living on subducting plates that border the oceans will find themselves covered with a depth of ocean water that they cannot resist. They will surely drown. That means all of India, over a billion people, will drown in India because the Himalayas will push right over this island of India. It was an island 40 million years ago when it reached the continent of Asia and pushed up the mountains. Well, this time... It will subduct, we are told, and India will go under the water. Now, Bangladesh is already sinking, and so there is some validity to this. Indonesia has already sunk. Those situated where rapid subduction occurs on areas above sea level may find themselves on hot earth during the moments following a pole shift when the crust stops moving and the plates, in essence, slam into each other like a train whose engine suddenly comes to a stop. Now, when those plates crush together, it creates a lot of heat, and it melts rock. And you don't want to be near that hot rock. So you 
might do well to know a little bit about the tectonic plates. Now you can do this in advance. Whether or not there's a pole shift, it won't hurt you to know this stuff. I don't think there's any place on Earth that's absolutely safe. If it isn't the ocean sloshing, the rock melting, and the winds blowing, then you can look up in the sky and see all the petrochemicals raining down upon you. If there's any oxygen in the air, it will burn those petrochemicals. You'll see fire coming down from the sky, meteors showering down on you with an average weight of 70 pounds. And as they're coming into the atmosphere, they have fire because they're hot and they will ignite those petrochemicals and it will burn up all the oxygen in the air. So you suffocate from a lack of oxygen. So tell me where it would be safe because I'm dying to know. You guys with your gardens who are writing to me and telling me you're going to be safe because you have a garden, you don't know what you're talking about. A knowledge of the tectonic plates is vital because when these plates crush together and the rock melts, you're going to cook. She says, here, I'm talking about Nancy Leader. She says, here height helps. As the greater the distance from where the friction between the crusts is creating heat, the better. So she's saying, find out where the contact points are between the crustal plates and get the hell out of there. <laughs> get as far as you can from there when you have these days of darkness or light. In China, they're going to have darkness. In New York City, they're going to have noonday sun for three or four days. So if the sun does not set and it's midnight and it's still straight up there in the sky, the earth has stopped rotating, it's time for you to get out of the city, get away from the coast, and get away from the tectonic plates. I don't know if you're going to be able to buy gasoline, and uh, Nancy has been reporting that there will be cars scattered all over the place, abandoned because they ran out of gas. How can the truckers bring in the gasoline if everything is in total chaos? It'll be pandemonium. If you want to buy your gasoline now and store it somewhere in a garage or somewhere in gasoline cans and not tell anybody because they'll kill you for it, that might be a good idea. But I don't know what's a good idea at a time of panic. I've been in California earthquakes many times. And the worst ones you can't prepare for. How can you prepare for a building falling on you? How can you prepare for a freeway falling on top of you? And then combine that with the tectonic plates crushing together, heating up, melting rock, winds blowing, petrochemicals raining down from the sky, meteors falling on you. It will be a most terrible day. When these plates crush together, the heat can be great enough to melt rock as witnesses who have survived such terrifying sights attest. Volcanoes, active and inactive, will explode violently, covering the surrounding areas in raining rock and dust and superheating the air so that all life nearby is extinguished in a wink. Next paragraph. Lightning and firestorms from falling walls of flaming petrochemicals formed during the interaction of gases with volcanic heat and continuous lightning cannot be predicted. They can happen worldwide and, as with the hurricane force winds, are a factor of the atmosphere, not the land mass. Where they are rare, these firestorms are devastating and burn all beneath the falling wall of flame in a holocaust. The horrified victims have little chance to even realize what is happening before they are engulfed and lose consciousness from the lack of oxygen. As with spontaneous human combustion, the victim is unconscious during the burning process. Protection from this rare chance of devastation is best attained by sheltering under a metal roof which will not burn. No, a metal roof that is hit by a 70-pound rock will no longer provide you with shelter. There is no safe place. Now you see why government doesn't want to tell you. What could they possibly say to you? You're going to die a horrible death? You're going to have a most terrible day? Last paragraph. In rural areas, survivors find themselves dealing less with the collapse of civilization than with climate changes. At first, stores are eaten until gone, 
and then real concern about the inability to grow crops sets in. Will the sun never shine through the clouds? My God, we could have a decade of cloudy skies, which means starvation, because you've got to be able to grow plants and distribute them to the people who need them. Who's going to do that? And for what? Money? Money will be worthless. Who would want to collect money? Pieces of paper with numbers on it? That's not what you need. You need food. Food will be more important than money or gold or silver. Might be a good idea to trade some money for food in cans now. But how long will you last? You can't last a decade when the sun is no longer shining through the clouds. This will cause people, the survivors, to wander. Seeking a land where the sun shines. And these people will be thinking that they're on the wrong side of the earth for some reason. How far can they wander? And how convenient will it be to find water along that route that they wander? Starvation soon has survivors eating everything in sight, chewing on old leather, eating the branches of dead trees. But still the gnawing hunger continues. Death by starvation is also relatively painless as a stupor sets in. The mind is dulled and languor envelops the human who is essentially asleep when death comes. This is the end of the most terrible day. Thanks for watching.